Good morning, everybody. Saturday. Nine. So, and the problem is, I also checked to see if you could, if, for example, the auto, I could search the auto, and it, as I emailed you, it looked like in the first four, he, Dylan, translated it either he, you know, used it as the, as the masculine pronoun, or when it was um, good nature itself, or self, Welcome, my friend. he transla didn't translate it at all. And that was in the first four. I was just, actually I was checking to see if we had the text right, because they ha it has a very strange name. All the names in TLD are in Latin. So then I went to the regular public free version, Hmm. And I did a search there, and I can't, they, they don't have Alcanus in the public version. Mm -hmm. You have to have the private version. So that would mean maybe that if you wanted it, because <clears throat> it would give, we have several options. One, print out 30 pages of auto. Mm -hmm. That's possible. And then you'd see it like this. Mm -hmm. They won't let you reduce, reduce it the way they used to, to one line of Greek. But it does let you place yeah, it, yeah, yeah, and yeah, you can yeah. work maybe more with the English. I that will way. find out. Let me know, because I will print it out if you want. Definitely. Okay. See the 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 question. <clears throat> what do you think? Okay. It's gone. They're good. Okay. Yeah, they shouldn't be coconut. I shouldn't put um, blueberries into the coconut. So. Dylan. They're uh -huh. little ones too. So. Has done a great many works, and I want to understand what it means for him to talk about his caution, his reluctance, his hesitancy in translating. Proclus's commentary on the Parmenides. That's what mm. I want to know. Mm. On the Parmenides? Yeah. Mm. So you think he might do that in where? Well, he says that, you see, in, the inter in his introduction. Ah, uh -huh. That he was hesitant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I don't understand that. Why would he, in a public statement in the introduction, admit to the public, to the world, that I normally would not even get into the Parmenides, but yet he translates like the Handbook of Platonism by Alcinus and other works. Like what, what is it about the Parmenides that is so fearful? Mm -hmm. Or so or, much in, or, or, or so much in disrepute that he risks his scholarly reputation by translating it. Yeah. You know? It's hard to know what his rationale is. I impossible, you're saying. We don't we can't I'm gonna grab a cup of coffee and come back. But I'll keep my ears peeled. What about uh, well there's Jacob Klein's uh, pers perspective on it, right? It's just a piece of logic. <laughs> I was just That's talking nice. about Jacob Klein. <laughs> oh, yeah? Like, why would, why would someone who's got it made, right, Trin Trinity College, <clears throat> with all of his background, admit in his introduction, in his writing, in the Proclus's commentary on the Parmenides, that, oh yeah, um, <laughs> the thought of having to translate this work on the Parmenides is was something normally I would never get into. What? Was that before or after he read it? Uh, well, be, well, it's a dual. Uh, Maro was the original translator, and he died, so yes. Dylan finished it. And he says, you know, normally he's right. I, I, I wouldn't get in. What? <laughs> so what? You did it for money? What's, what's I, the deal? I, 
No, no, I want to understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, it's, why? A, it's an unusual apology of something, you know. Like, <laughs> it'd be different if it was like, you know, I would like to, I, I hope that I was able to get as close to the Greek translation as I could. That's not this. No. I mean, that would be a fair tra reason, but. Yeah, look at this. I don't know where it is. When you say you read the introduction to the commentary, you've really read the book. Yeah, it's it. Although we also know about crazy. First paragraph. I'll read the whole paragraph. I was going to know. <clears throat> In 1973, Glenn Morrow, the Adam Cybret Professor Emeritus of Moral and Intellectual Philosophy at the University of Pittsburgh, died. While still rather less than halfway through the translation of Proclus's commentary, on the Parmenides. He had published the commentary on the first book of Euclid in 1970 and had plainly developed in his retirement a taste, watch this language now, a taste for the torturous ramifications of Proclus's style and thought. Mm. <laughs> torturous ramifications of Proclus's style. Okay, that's the first step. Charles Kahn at the University of Pitch, Pennsylvania, Morrow's literary executor, asked me if I would be willing to complete the work. I accepted the task without much thought, although I had various other commitments since I felt it would be a good excuse to give a close reading of a work that I might otherwise be tempted to avoid. Hmm. Wow. He's in a crisis. <coughs> okay. What do you... Crisis. kind of sounded like you were saying, I kind of want to do it, but I don't want to admit it. Like, David? Um, it's not in his, uh, it wasn't, it's not in his, um, hmm. I don't know. Um, it doesn't fit his agenda for platonic studies. <coughs> he has an agenda, and uh, he has a certain kind of thing he wants to accomplish, and Parmenides doesn't reflect that. Hmm. Come on, Barbara. It's puzzling because he thinks Proclus's thought is, I'm going to use the word convoluted, yet he wants, he sees it as an opportunity to give a close reading, right? And he, that he might otherwise be tempted to avoid. Just so it's like the, no, the, well, the states of mind are very odd, right? Isn't that, isn't that strange? Yeah. Virginia? Well, he's presenting that he's for, he's looking forward to a torturous task. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm going, you mean you're not in point to look forward to <coughs> seeing maybe some new insight or why this guy did this kind of work? Never even get close no, to that. No, not even. And tempted to avoid it means that he tempted to avoid yeah, it. Yeah, tempted to avoid it. I crisis. may be tempted he's to in a crisis. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like he has a paradigm of which he's already interpreting an emotional response to torturous ramifications. And so at the same time, while still recognizing that there might be something there. So it sounds like he might be able to put his like big toe into it, but those conclusions that he has are going to stop him from really being able to dive into it and appreciate it. So I see it just when I see it differently. It's not. He's not interested in getting into it. He would be tempted to avoid it. 
but it's a torch, and it, he sees it as carrying a see, cross. But he, see, he also translated a work called The History of Platonism by Alcinos. Mm -hmm. <coughs> you know, like he's in the stuff, he's in the work. And that's a pretty obscure work, I think. That's yeah. a pretty obscure work, right? Is, is that a history book, though? Is that a history rather than... The philosophy of history. Philosophy of history. Maybe that's where he's at more than looking in, into ideas. He does want to... Alcin, Alcinous does seem to want to set forth the, the elements, the basic, fun, the fundamentals of Platonism, at least in the first couple that I read. Yeah, yeah. I was reading the, the Amazon, um, you know, search me kind of thing. And it, it looks like he's he's basically quoting different, very coming very close to quotes from Platonic works and setting out different yeah. parts of it. So it's not purely a history, but rather like a, 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 a manual, in that sense, a handbook, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So we'd want to have a conversation with him and ask him, like, what's so torturous about Proclus's thought or the ramifications yeah. of it? Or what? how do you see this, you know, to actually understand yeah. his view? Yeah, before I open my mouth, what do you say on it? <laughs> not, not much to add, sorry. All good insights. And he's putting that as the introduction to the work. Does it leave any reader looking forward to it? You know, like I've spent my life preparing to deal with one of the great works in philosophy that is normally ignored through our culture, mm -hmm. but I turn to it. Eager. <laughs> try to turn to it with the sense that there's a challenge here worth unearthing and exploring mm. and sharing with my fellow man. Nope. Dial yeah. and thought. <sighs> May the gods guide me. Yes. Being just thinking that's where I. <coughs> that's where I was thinking you might. Uh, might be looking forward to it, you know, having, as we're saying, kind of want to be into it and don't want to be into it, but I think he, he probably was cornered or felt cornered and had to write this torturous part for his colleagues. Yeah. Kind of like uh, Dodds. I apologize yeah. for even translating this. <laughs> no, like, um, it's like I spent my life being a professional Greek scholar, hmm. and it's my job to translate. And I just happened to, oh, someone called me up. He died. Hey, would you finish it? Yeah, I said, what the hell? I got, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, that's, but no I sense, think that's the no term. sense of appreciation of the philosophical no. side of this work <laughs> is anywhere in the, inter in the introduction. I still thank him for it. Just like I thank Dodds, without Dodds' translation of like Proclus's Elements or this one, who else will be ahead? Yeah. It's so, you know, like. He still cares too much about what others think. Mm. See, what I would yeah. like him to do would have been, well, since Morrow got halfway into it, I want to make a mark where I begin and so mm. we can know. Hmm. True. Was he still around? No mark. Or did he amend the Yeah, go through the whole thing, thus, you know, alter it in every part in some way. No. Right. Is that not clear where it's not clear where one started and the other no. no we don't even know if he edited his, what he felt like. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Does he yeah. mention Thomas Taylor? Yes, he does. Oh, that's good. In, in a positive way. Oh. Yeah. So he could have said, well, I'm doing this instead of Thomas Taylor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh. I think you're right, though. Like, to point out that uh, having him as a professional would really account for the various components, yeah. right? That he could have perhaps avoided it. Maybe nobody would have noticed that he didn't do it. Yeah. But 
as a professional who's responsible for the major works of the corpus now he can give it a close reading which is a plus because then it will be part of his bag of tricks but really he doesn't want to yeah i think that's he's your worker yeah you found a job to do i got a job i'm a translator my sister she uh is in geology and uh there's certain things she'd like to do too but <laughs> right. mm. Everybody has a job. <laughs> no, no. But how can he translate? Uh, how do you pronounce his name? Synesius? Mm. That's pretty close, I think. And Synesius. The history of Plato, and get into all of that without having an appreciation. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Because he is an academic, right? Yeah. yeah, he's got a job. And therefore, <clears throat> despite his own personal taste, right, he has to um, translate the corpus. But he's really choosy. I think that doesn't uh, isn't a complete answer. I wonder if I missed my you, mark. By any chance, uh, happen to see his introduction to the Synesius translation, Barbara? Ramifications. There isn't one. Oh. It's in the, um, I think she put it. Okay. Sorry, two questions. I was looking for that phrase, torturous ramifications. I said and torturous. It sounded oh. like it was torturous, the way he oh. described it. Okay. Okay. Trepidation. Yes. What do you Fear, yeah. yeah. First oh. paragraph. No, that word was there. Torturous? Yeah, was it torturous? So. Barbara, do you remember his introduction by any chance to the Synesius translation? No, I don't. I'm sorry. It'd be interesting if he had a similar apology. Yeah, is that the <laughs> only one translation we have is his? F to Synesius, the dreams work? On dreams you're talking? No, the history of, uh, or was, what was the one that you guys were talking about earlier? I haven't Alcinius? Seen or was that a different one? Yeah, Alcinius. that was the other one. There is a history of philosophy. Oh, Alcinus. 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 That's the other translation that he had done before. Yeah. This, right? Oh, I don't know if it's before. Is it before? Uh, I don't yes, know that. Yes, likely before. Yeah, huh? likely before. And that was my question: is how could he do all of that without coming out? Alcanus is trans. Yeah, is that's you got the question. You have it. Whoa, you got good stuff here. I yeah. Go on to Parmenides, right? Or yeah. <clears throat> uh, is Alcanus classified as as Hellenistic? Alcanus. Yes. So he's going to regard, huh? That isn't a reason, though. Sorry, just I was just considering where he, where he fell with your remark of if he if he does Alcanus, why doesn't he do? Yeah, Parmenides. He is a worker. Like I'm thinking that what without without your questions, Pierre, that you've asked myself and many, all of us to how to look at the text or even consider looking at it yeah. in a certain way. Well, so Barbara, what she bring you up to date. So I have the question. We have discovered a rather curious thing, that in the Greek language there's certain key words that have philosophical significance, widespread significance. Self, usia, being, or ontos, Right, those three are central. How does he handle those terms in his, his history of Platonism? Does he write on his own a history of Platonism, Dylan? Sorry to be so ignorant. Does Dylan write, or are you talking about the Alcanus book? Alcinus, Alcinus. I'm talking about Alcinus. Yeah, does. you might want to go with k because we, they don't have a s except for an You okay. might want to go with alkinus or oh, alkinus. Oh, with a K rather than yeah. a C, okay. Pronunciation-wise, right? I'll do it. Alkinos, thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah. So I understand that you have a question about, is it all relative? I, um, uh, right. Yes, but I'm not... 
gone over it multiple times. I have questions, but I'm really not prepared to attack it vigorously. Let's do it. Let's do it another time. Well, really? Review of coming in I mean, I didn't even bring the book with me this morning, so you don't need the book, do you? No, I really, no. I really don't want to do it. Okay. Now. Okay, that's fair. Oh, we got. I one. know the feeling. No, he really doesn't want to do it now. Kind of. Uh, oh, you're just bypassing that. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, because I, I didn't bring the questions that I had either. I've got a list of them, so. And I really want to wrap my head around it one more time before we. Well, let me. Uh, <clears throat> the elements is the among At least the one more time. Huh? Elements? No, the. Uh, is it all real? Uh huh. I thought that was on your bookshelf. No? Uh, I had an older version. Bradley! Hey, Brad. Brad. I, I got nothing. Just mm. up the house. He's going through. Do you going want, through his Pierre, uh, David, do you want a copy of those articles of Jimmy Shen or do you not care? <laughs> I do care, damn it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just didn't want to. I printed out a copy, then I gave it away that last night, and then oh, printed out another glasses. copy. But I was going to. Your glasses are on my shelf. Dave. I, oh, okay. Those are the three. Thank you so much. Oh. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. No, no, it shouldn't be. Really. Unfortunately, I couldn't get my printer to print. You dropped There's three your of them there. Right between the cracks on the. Oh, mm. Between Aren't they nice? your yeah. feet. No, no, I don't want to. I just, I don't want to do it right now. Okay, it's all right. I haven't looked at it in three days, and I'm not going <clears> to be sharp. I How really about just want. giving us one question off the list? Just one. I just want to get a sample. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A teaser. Just, uh, she just wants a little sample. You know, just give her a little one. Forthcoming thing. A little one. A little, yeah. yeah. Just we all have some familiarity with it. We can play with the question, right? Have you got a copy of the, 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 the I've been having so many things change in my life that I don't know where any of my books are anymore. Elements. I think where it gets interesting for me, Pierre, is at the bottom of page 29, which is uh, four pages before the end of part one. Mm -hmm. And I've only read part one, haven't gone on at all yet to two or three. <coughs> Uh, and it has to do with, um, I don't have the direct quote in here, that's why I need the book, but it has to do with being a competent judge. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I had a question, I had several questions about that part and everything that follows. Yeah. Because two, well, the idea of competency was introduced at that point. Competition, competency, to be competent. That's the first time the word was used. Curious word, is you Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. I'm just going to help this one second. He's speaking loudly on here. And judging. Mm -hmm. Now, judging had been used previously, and I went back and found it. But it's curious to me that Harry would even want to talk about judging. Oh, he's in. Because if knowledge is perception, well, there is no judging, right? Yeah, you did. Yeah, you're good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Strictly speaking, yes. If you mean by the, it's immediate, it doesn't take reflection. So it's that one I kind of want to understand a little bit better because everything that follows on the last four pages yeah. of part one yeah. is based on mm -hmm. that idea of judging. And I'm not so sure that Harry would go along with that, re uh, that, um, that, that, that he would hold to that position, that, that, that that's what he was actually saying. 
Well, it's a judgment without reflection. Yeah. But to reflect means you have to, I mean, like, how can you make a judgment without reflection? How can you? How can, what you just said, how can one do that? How can you make a judgment without reflecting? But look here. Unless you it's agree. Just, you agree. You agree. How, yeah, but that agreement. You agree. A, Therefore, what if that is tr if holding that position? Can one still say knowledge is perception? Since you've just convinced me that one needs reflection and judgment before yes. they can make the judgment that knowledge is perception. If those things are necessary as precursors to knowledge, then there cannot be this thing called knowledge is perception, since it's immediate, doesn't take reflection or judgment. So, so you're agreeing. Me personally. Yeah. That judgment requires reflection. Yeah. Yes, that's that's what I'm saying. That's the problem I have with it because um, th those two ideas seem very much opposite. Um, it, it does take reflection to judge. But that depends upon what you're coming with for the idea of knowledge. That it requires judgment and reflection. Yes. Because there is such a thing as immediate intuition into the nature of reality that requires no judgment to get there or in it okay. or through it. So the people who argue that knowledge is perception, if they're claiming it has an immediacy and validity to it, just its immediacy, well, they're really using an idea that doesn't belong in perception of physical reality, but perceptions of the mind. Therefore, the claim that knowledge is perception is incomplete because most people who make that statement are not talking about Plotinus's use of the idea of knowledge being instantaneous, instant intuition of the nature of ultimate reality that requires no pre-thought or thought or judgment. They should say, knowledge is perception of the everyday world. That's what they really mean. Yeah. But they're they cut things short because they think they don't need it, but in reality they do. Yep. Mm -hmm. Because it's the only kind of perception that they are aware of. Yeah. Right? So therefore, they think you don't. I was just. Yeah. Yeah. I'm wondering. Since they tend to be deniers of the other, they, yes. they don't think they need to qualify it because they don't think there can be another that can contrast with it or be compared with it. Yeah. Now, uh, like that that argument, all this relevancy, is weak yep. because when we were in Athens, mm. uh, in Greece, during this convention on the first... First International Olympics of Philosophy or yes. something, right? Yes. A guy by the name of Alton gave a talk. And he addressed the philosophers that were there from the University of Athens directly. See, they were in the first row. And he's pointing to them and he's saying, if you are right about this idea that knowledge is perception and it's relative to every single individual, different necessarily because each person 
stands, as it were, in a different position, and therefore all of their perceptions would vary. He said, if you want to say that, it's not just a question of sight. If you're not just making a judgment about visual things, that everyone has a visual position, but they want to make that claim to knowledge. He said something that, that I'll never forget. He said, if you are right about that, then there must be some neurophysiological basis for making that distinction. And the only thing you could conclude must be that every single person who gains a particular kind of knowledge, not, per, not just perception, but the whole world of mind, it presupposes that everybody has a unique and different neurophysiological apparatus. Hmm. Which means that everybody is a different kind of species, because that differentiates species. He says, that's how, that's how absurd your position is. That was serious. That's serious. Oh, wow. That's good. Brought it down oh, well, to where it is. Right. Like no, yeah. By the way, it had it's absolutely beautiful. no <laughs> effect on these guys. <laughs> no, absolutely none, you know. There they are. <laughs> right? Yep. They didn't even have the courage to ask him or answer anything. They just all nodded to one another. Like, go ahead, rave on. Hmm. Didn't hear him. But I would have liked to, uh, to have followed the neurophysiological approach to that argument. Yeah. But I didn't hmm. see. Uh, and I don't now. How would you do it? Would that fall? Yeah. I mean, there may be some s differences, but the basic elements are there. Would be neurophysiological. Well, the basic element of neurophysiology. I'm wondering, doesn't DNA have uh, a basic, is, isn't that neur neurophysiological? I'm not sure at this point, but if you you wouldn't have a DNA structure then that would be common to all cells. See, to make that judgment, I would like to see why it follows. Oh, that knowledge is, is perception, even on the on on the. ID. No, just what you just said. Oh, I see. Like, what argument would? What, what scientific data would you have to have in your possession to go along with that reasoning? That therefore every individual is absolutely unique neurophysiologically in the quest for knowledge. You said, hey, that would mean that the DNA must be different equally depending upon each individual. How did you make that stuff? Because neurophysiology presupposes a DNA structure. No, if it's unique to each, that would mean that there wouldn't be a DNA structure. Because that that's would be commonality. Common. Right, it would be that a DNA structure for each individual, and therefore you couldn't do, I mean, they, there is differences. And they have DNA testing for different things. So they can, but it's all probability on that level, but there is a common structure that they're basing their individual differences on. Then you could have contributed that viewpoint at that moment yeah. that you're just saying. I remember that yeah. for some reason. It just popped in my head and I remember him yeah. leaning over the, over the podium. It, it, it's a guy I'm thinking of. Yeah, yes. Alton was the... Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't in a place for that. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, that, that would have been an interesting byline. Though I don't think much of it, by the way. Why not? Yeah. Because I don't think arguments that reduce themselves to physiology are significant. Well. I think there's interesting, it's supportive, but yeah. I don't think it's decisive. 
it's a reductio ad absurdum anyway, right? By structure, that argument. It's not a, it's not a du direct proof in that sense. No. It's indirect, right? If knowledge were perception, then everyone's way, everyone's knowledge would have to be different. If everyone's knowledge has to be different, and it's through perception, therefore the organ that that brings about the knowing, therefore the perce perceiving elements would have to be different uniquely, right? And they would have to be physically distinct, right? Is his argument? Yes. Right? And it, so it seems, and since they are not, I think yeah. the argument would go. Therefore, yeah. Right. And so that's that's reductio ad absurdum. But I'm not exactly sure I even follow his argument. Sure. I'm not sure I follow even yeah, his argument. The devil. Well, it's the very devil in the donuts. Uh, because, I agree. Uh, oh. You agree? <laughs> uh, because why is it necessary that each... Hi. Oh, my name's David. You're looking for Kim, right? Uh, look at the, yeah, Kim. Okay, let me take it around. Yeah. Uh, this is, this is not a Kim one. group. Why is it necessary that if a person holds that knowledge is perception, that each person have a different neurophysiology? Because uh, the reason I ask that is uh, I don't see that it's necessary that everyone have necessarily a different neurophysiology. <coughs> All we have to do is be sitting in different chairs. <coughs> and we have a different geometric angle on something. The, the potato chips we're looking at, we all see a different <coughs> angle. That doesn't require that we have, and we could say knowledge is perception. All right. uh, we all have a different point of view on that bull. Uh, right? It doesn't require that we have different neurophysiology. Oh. So Do you want some more coffee, Pierre? As insignificant hmm. as his reduction. I agree. I observant, uh, oh, <laughs> thank you. Oh. But uh, uh, he has some here. The uh, <laughs> Don't I think it would be more <laughs> fun to say what are the objects that one can perceive upon which you make the claim that knowledge is perception. Thank you. What are the objects? Yes. Yeah. Now, if someone wants to say all physical things, all physical things, yeah, then they dropped out mathematics. Well, they've dropped out not just mathematics, but all ideas. Oh. Judgment. Right. And the problem, that is another question I had. I mean, as soon as you say knowledge is perception, are you talking physical only? Are you, or are we going to call ideas? Because as soon as you talk about ideas, you're talking about some kind of judging again, because you had to reflect yeah. on it. Like there couldn't be geometry. Nope. Don't you think, though, that the, the person who thinks that knowledge is perception would also say that even if you and I were sitting in exactly the same chair and looking at exactly the same, like, for whatever, hypothesize that, that such a thing could be the case, that still our perception of that object would be different, right? <coughs> that, don't you think that they are, they're going to argue that the perceiver is well, unique? And that's, that's, see, that's the question, is where, where does the uniqueness lie? Does it lie only in the angle of perception? Or does it lie in the, because I think people who say knowledge is perception want to say, I know differently than you know, and my knowledge is, is true for me, right? So I'm thinking it, it, is, it isn't only the variance of dark to light, position, angle, but also the fact that they would hold that the, per the perceiver is unique, I think. But I... I well, I... Uh, I'm not sure I can represent them, and therefore I'm not sure I can answer your question, but um, uh, I don't remember, I'd like to stick with the text, and as far as part one, I don't remember that being... Oh, I was talking about the position in general, the position held by... in general, yeah. Um, it's, and but, you don't have to answer it, I was just yeah, saying, I don't know it's I another way to see the knowledge is perception question, or I another aspect. I would like to see that represented in its 
in its strongest form outside of Pierre's book. I don't know if there is a stronger. Uh, yeah, wow. Well, just to see where they're Good going. luck with that. But I. Um, is that stronger in the theater side? The position, as I'm, up, uh, the position uh, as I'm picking it up from different. Pierre's book is that um, it, it, uh, it's, of course, not just physical. It, Harry says it also includes cultural biases and family upbringing and blah blah blah. So maybe that gets towards your your answer that everybody your question that everybody would be different by virtue of these things. But you could still push your question further and say, yeah, but what if someone even had the same culture, exact cultural upbringing, and even had the exact same family experiences? No. I, well, I'm thinking in the purest case, and that may not be the may not be what's called the purest case, but that a person that part of it hangs on the fact that they want the individual in as an individual to be the authority. You know, to be the knower, to be absolute in his uniqueness, in his vision, his or her vision. Yeah. But I don't know that. I mean that's, that's David was question. suggesting that Theotetus might give us but I uh, um it definitely it definitely provides an in-depth discussion of the perceiving of the object. What comes from the perceiver, what comes from the object, the perception takes place in between. Something new arises at each second or instant. But I, I, think, but Barbara, I, think, just, I think, Barbara, what you said, though, yes, there are different angles, but you're adding an element that says that each individual's angle is true for him to whom it, it seems to be that way. Not so, the angle. Or I'm, I'm taking that as an object. Point of view. Yeah, that each, physical, whatever I is mean. true for him or whomever it perceives that. Once you add the element of truth in it, then that takes, that takes it out of actually the realm of perception. There is differences in how we perceive things adding truth to it means that there's something, um, what is it, you're, you're taking on a, a, an absolute thing. But I think that's the formal statement, isn't it? It's true for him to whom it seems so. Well, that's what I'm saying. That what you're, that's what I think, that's what I said. That I'm adding that he is, just looking from a perception level, yes, there are differences. Once you add, and you added it, you were the one that said it, so I'm just repeating. Well, it adds a sense of authority and sacrosanct. Yeah. It's like, it makes it even uh, not only true, but you are the authority and that you can't be challenged. For anything in, that you perceive. But, the, but, you know, one of the many problems that Pierre brings up in the book with that is that the, is that the statement itself is global. I mean, like the whole world accepts this statement. He's he's not just Harry is not just saying what is true for whatever is true for me is true for is true for me. He's saying that this also applies to everyone around me, but that's inherently contradictory mm -hmm. because only they can say whether they want to play in that world or not. I think the argument goes that what I say is what you say is true for you. I can say that you're wrong, and therefore what I say is true for me is true. Right, so then that brings in the whole problem of the word judging. Mm -hmm. Why would Harry even use the word judge? <clears throat> I think when See, Elea says, again on this page 29, Elea says, yes, a, a holder of this position would hold that he can judge all positions, that he can judge all things, sorry. Yeah. But as I read it, Harry's position is not that he can judge all things, it's that he can judge no things. He can judge no, no things? things. Hmm. What do you mean no things? N O? Well, yeah, he can he cannot judge anything. It depends on does the judgment hold for me or does it hold for everybody else? In, a, in other words, what does it mean to say we judge? If, if he's are we judging and coming to a conclusion that holds for all of us? Is there an absolute aspect to that judgment? Or do I only judge for me? What does the word judge mean? Well, 
And it's, it, you can, so you can take it both ways. Harry's position is that he can judge all things. You can also take it that he can judge nothing because... And you can find that position in the text? Yeah, because what he's saying <coughs> is each, what is true for him is, is, is true for the person who, for whom it seems to be true, right? But okay, but only for me. Well, what kind of judgment is that? Oh, that's your judgment of his judgment. I'm saying the question is, what do we mean by the word judgment? Exactly. So you're thinking it's, a inco it's an inadequate, what? It's inaccurate to say Harry is judging if he's only judging for himself? I think that's the question I have, is how can he, how can he say he's judging? <clears throat> how can we even use that word to apply to his position? How can we use the word to apply to yeah, his how position? Can, how can, yes, because that's the point in the dialogue where it's re it is really seriously begun to be used, the word judge, a competent judge of something. And Elias says, yes, the position, the, the holder of such a position would say that they can judge all things. And I'm thinking, wait, I can see that. Yes, you can judge all things, but only for yourself. Uh, well, then you can't really strictly, judge all things. Strictly speaking, you, can judge you can't nothing. even say it strictly for yourself. Yeah. Hmm. Because. Because it would change. Because. Well. You're making a distinction between yourself and others. Mm. And if you're going to base it all on perception, you can't make a statement independent of your perceptions. Therefore, when you're saying, strictly speaking, only for myself, <clears throat> you're assuming there are other things, but you cannot have a perception of other things independent of your own. That's right. Mm. And equally well, when the person who says, hey, everything, everything. Knowledge is perception, and it's true for everyone else. Uh-oh. He just moved from personal judgments to everyone else. That's not allowed. He can't do that. He can't, that's right. So there are many, clearly there are many problems with that. So it ends up being solipsism. Everything I say can only be true for myself. And by the way, I'm even cautious about using the word truth. Well, and that's right. And, and, you, and the you better not raise, raise your hand. You better just jump in and talk loud. Come on. Raising your hand won't work. Move your chair closer, too, by. the sun. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay, we'll let you off. That's okay. Yeah. Thanks for the donuts, by the way. Here's yes, thank you. Yeah. I'm perceiving them as very healthy, filled with vitamins, well, no fat, no, no carbs, healthy, no gluten. Politically, healthily correct or not, but <laughs> I don't think I gave them a Huh? <laughs> it said go Yes. So, uh, we have a pocket tangerine right here. Well, the, uh, based on this idea of knowledge, if everybody, uh, if, if the statement is knowledge can be uh, arrived at through perception, uh, then, then, then everybody's perception is different then their idea of knowledge would be different they would have a right and then would that take away the idea of right or wrong uh, as being uh, a reality that's right, that's right. Uh, abstracted yeah. knowledge so knowledge wouldn't include right or wrong. It would just be a personal That's right. thing. So, and then I have a problem with even reducing it to the physical level of the idea that uh, even in the physical world, knowledge, physical knowledge can be arrived at merely through perception with the argument of the angle of uh, view or sight that the object is seen from, uh, that the individuals might be seen different parts of the object that they're trying to achieve knowledge of. And they're, the, part, the different part that they're seeing uh, would indeed could be a diff different, but it wouldn't change the nature or reality of the object. They, were, they would just be limited to seeing a certain part of it, and that would be a limit in their sight. The nature of the object would be what it is, 
That's true. So they couldn't argue that they're uh, that because they're seeing it from that angle, their perception is a perception of the object. It's just the perception of the part of the object that they're seeing. The object is stands on its own. They're just not seeing the whole thing. See, you're even using words that aren't allowed, strictly speaking with this position, this position, right? That implies because, essence, right? Yeah. Nature, right. Is nature yeah. yeah. Yeah, right, See, right. In essence, the only thing you perceive is color, period. Pick, uh, light no. reflecting off of... All you perceive is color. You don't perceive objects. Right, right, right. It's the light reflecting... All you see is light reflecting off objects. Right. And that reflection is nothing other than color. Strictly speaking, you can't talk about an, that knowledge is perception presupposes objects. You don't see objects, you see color. They should say, the only kind of knowledge you can get with perception is color. With visual the, perception. With the, the only kind of knowledge you can get with visual perception. Thank you. Right? So well, in essence... The same can be done for the other senses. Now, see, we're breaking it down to where, <coughs> at what point are they making true statements? Even with color, it would depend uh, on which, uh, you know, what, what light what you were, uh, you know, experiencing if you were in the shade. See, now this is why Plato has fun in the Theotetus. He said, you can have a lot of fun with this position. You don't have to deal with it. Right. right, you can have a lot of fun with it. You can say, hey, the reason most people make mistakes as the sun goes down is that there's not enough light. And therefore, a lot of people can be called dimwits as the sun goes down and totally ignorant when there's not even the light of the moon. So everybody is ignorant. Right? He's, having, he's having fun. Right? Then he says, hey, if what you're saying is true, he said, wouldn't you agree a pig perceives? Therefore, you want to say you have the same knowledge as a pig. Right. In other words, you can, you can say, you don't take the position seriously. Have fun with it, you know, just jab it and then get up for a kill. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what he does. Yeah, the best you know? part is that you don't, you don't have to deal with this argument. Have fun with it. Poke around with it. Make the person feel uncomfortable by even raising the question. Since I watch plumbers, Therefore, I know what they do. I see them. <laughs> That's it. See? You should pay me to do your plumbing. Yeah. yeah. So it might even work. I saw this guy pilot your plane. Yeah, right? I watched a surgeon. Let me cut you open. <laughs> yeah. So he, that's his approach. See, he, he, doesn't take the, he doesn't take this position seriously. He says you can have fun with it first. First. So then, of course, you can then deal with it seriously. That usually pisses them off, though. Yeah, first piss them off. It doesn't necessarily invite them to the serious portion as well. The serious portion is the problem. That's the way, that's the, way the world is run, is on that. You know, that's what's serious about it. If it was just a group of people that weren't affecting anybody thinking that, yeah. but we're, we're living this. Well, it's like a veiled, it's a veiled argument for why it's okay to remain ignorant. Because there is there is no right or wrong, or good or bad, and it's just your perception, and people per per perceive right. things differently, and it allows you to ignore reality. How far reality, do you carry that? Whatever's yeah. happening, you know, like... How far do you carry that? It really... Yeah, right? and by the way, would right. you agree, there's nothing really bigger than your thumb? <laughs> Agree? Yes, I do. Yes. 
You're an <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> Mount Everest, you'd fit <laughs> in it in my thumb. Yeah. You make fun of the position, you know? Yeah. <laughs> by the way, why is it that things, if, if it is true, wouldn't you agree that it is absolutely absolutely true <coughs> that as things move away from you they become smaller and smaller until they disappear and as they they only gain their reality when they come forward out of the nothingness and come close to you that's what he that's what he's doing. he's making fun of it see yeah i thought that too it's strange working with in trades because people are and are not relativists yeah like they're going to make a judgment about what they do, and you either know it or you don't. But then you get into other things, and then they become relativists. I was thinking, my coworker that got me the job, that he's he got fired, but I was gonna ask him. He's a total relativist. I was gonna, I was having fun with it, and I was thinking, hey, do you perceive reality better than me? Because your eyes are better than me, and if I don't have my glasses on, is your judgment of reality better than mine? Or, hey, I might have a little hearing damage in my right ear. Do you, so is your sense of reality entirely better than mine due to the fact that your hearing and sight is better than mine? Oh, and I have allergies, so I don't smell as good? I never got to that part, but I've been toying with it to see what he would do. And I'm sure I could ask somebody yeah. else. People with that view in your profession are dangerous. Yeah. Well, they, can, they don't hold it in their own field. They hold it about things like mm. love and ju you know the Politics. the bigger ideas. No, yeah. they, they're not going to hold that as to I actually know what I'm doing. He, that guy gets fired quick. Quick. You can't have him. Or a dead. Or, <laughs> <laughs> sure. Well, I mean, here, you, touch this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, Does it I, look I was hot? I'm going to add it to the other other higher up trades too. They they need to know what they're doing, or it's not going to work. Mm. Right, you don't want a, you don't want a serious relativist as a plumber or a heating and air conditioning guy either. They're, I know what I'm doing. No, you either know what you're doing or you don't. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Period. Or you have a. Well, I guess it's kind of degrees. You know so much and you're good to this level, but you can only do so much. Let's see what he. What have you got in the book? <laughs> oh, just lots of questions. Like, from their position, I, I have a friend who's a big-time relativist, um, and he's still when he's rich. really pushing it, I'll say to him, I'll respond to him, you're right, the sky is blue. It doesn't matter what he just said previously, I'll just hit him with something differently, because the point is, I mean, in other words, communication itself is a problem with solipsism, right? How do we, how can you, how can I even guarantee that what you just said to me I received. We, we can't even talk. That's where it goes. Yeah. Oh, you got to get Silence. into the... Uh, it's a lonely world. It's a really lonely world to live like that. Because you, you have no other communion with anything. You never know if what you shared with any other person is actually real or true. Because maybe you just believed it. That's right, Tang. <laughs> Cough that up. Cough it up. I uh, hate Jeff. When you get into the third part of the book, if I recall right, there's about oh, a page or two pages with a few steps, you and you can rip right to the core of that uh, uh, argument. I used to do it when I was 20. I made so many people really fucking mad at me. I had a that's all that happens, though. <laughs> and I, it's the, that's, oh. the, that's the best part. You never, you can't really change their. A few songs. Yeah, yeah, you find. Yeah, that's. Oh, That's the joy when you find one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what I find interesting about this book <clears throat> is I used to use it in class. So. <laughs> we were there. <laughs> and every, every semester, the same thing is true. Everything. That is, people can follow the argument. A good number of them. Some cannot, but a good number can follow the argument. And the next day, the next class, they come in. Everything is relative to the observer. Oh, yeah, 
Oh yeah, we did go over that, but I still think it's true. <coughs> right? It's it's a visceral. It's a you know. It's amnesia. They they, yeah. they cling to it. Oh yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, I remember the argument against it. Yeah, but I still think it's true. It's fade. It's like directly linked with a pathologos. Like, yeah. yeah, you know, like they have to, like, like they go together. Like even as a platonic philosopher, I watch myself go into the same arguments that I've seen are false, and it's like a very description of what's behind my pathologos, like perception and judging things from different perspectives, and also forgetting. Like I forget. Well, it's like uh, Cebius and Simmies. At the end, they followed the. The reasoning, and then they still went back to what they thought. Yeah. We followed you, and I yet I'm still gonna think what I yeah. thought before. Yeah, I I read the Gospel of Mark. Yeah, I realized <laughs> there's nothing in it that I thought was Christian, but I still believe that Mark is a Christian. Excuse me, what? I invited. Same two, thing. I invited two Mormons in. And try to go over it. <laughs> so, oh yeah, come in. Let's. You want to talk about the Bible? <laughs> and, it, and then, and then you know, probably 15 minutes into it, they're so, uh, running out. Telling maybe them we've done enough with it. <laughs> uh, uh, got anything more? Come on. No, I, uh, I have a ton more, but we can do it another time. Uh, what is at stake? Uh, what is at stake? Uh, slogans in thinking are ruinous to the, in, the use of the understanding. Hmm. All is relative is a slogan. They can get everybody around them to agree with it. It stops reflection. Yeah. It's a slogan, though. There's nothing behind it. It is what it is. So they may even yeah, and they may yeah, even yeah. see it, but really cling to it. it. <coughs> yellow, but, yellow. As so Josh said, hey, it's like a pathologos. So. Another, like? another tool and another another weapon in the war against seeing. Pardon me. Another weapon in the war against seeing. Yes, it is. It's so powerful. It's <coughs> but. When I asked what is at stake, I think I was coming at it from the angle, maybe I didn't ask it clearly enough. What is at stake for the person who has to consider the possibility of giving up that relative to you? Is it that they have to, well, I guess we just, you, you already answered it, right? They have to be willing to see that they can see. Well, that in it also means you have to... And that'll hit a pathologos right there, right? You have to be willing to admit that you've been living a lie for, for a <laughs> very long time. Life, right? yeah. A very long time. That's a hard one. And that everybody else around you is still going to live it. Yep. And then you got to decide whether... And they're probably not going to give it up. <laughs> and also that you must face judgment. Like, when you have a it's all relative, you could just avoid judgment by saying that's what you think. You know, that's your perspective. Right. It's like a, it's like a Jesus Christ Savior moment for you. Like, oh, I don't, I'm out of judging because right. that's just my perspective. Or that's your perspective. Whereas once you drop that, you have to face reason. Then there's truth and reality to both your blessed nature and your blood. And you got to see how far you carry that. <clears throat> right. How far that, how far is that thinking allowed you to act on that. Yeah. Believing that you were yeah. right and it was your perception. The actions that follow that thinking that you rationalize to yourself, you know? See, to answer your question, we would need a survey. But only survey the people who once believed it and no longer. So we can see what happened to them when they left that position or abandoned it and then had to face a kind of reality with that slogan kind of thinking. Now, I suspect <laughs> we can easily get the population <laughs> to sample right here. Whoa. 
Wouldn't you agree? At one point, you, you all accepted that argument, all is relative, right? So Some version e of it. Yeah, you could point, ask each know, person, hey, who... what got you out of it? What was it like? What did you experience in the transition? Do you find at times you might slip back to it? How do you account for it? It's the rough ascent. Right. I took your class. You went through the argument. I saw it. I couldn't deny it. And it was like the pane of glass through which I saw the world that had a giant crack in it. And I went, oh shit, everything I know it's just something else that somebody else told me that they know, and they don't know anything either. What the hell am I going to do now? Terrifying ramifications. Very close to what and happened then, uh, to me. And I was hanging out with Josh and Ingmar at the time, and they would just simply repeat to me the filth that I was spewing out of my own mouth. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't, like, question even any. They just repeated what I just said, and I had to hear it. And then I went, wow. So I ran away for a few months, and then it really bugged me, and I came back, and I was like, I don't, I don't know what's going on, but <laughs> there's something going on with these folks more than everybody else. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a crack right in that plain glass window that you look at the world, right? It's irrevocably cracked and broken. It's like a giant spider web crack. A wider, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some, people, some people come back, like Jeff. Other people don't. That's we right. We didn't get a second half. Like, get into it. Yeah. yeah. We just got what it was like before, and and then the transition. We didn't see what came in, as we want to hear what happened as a result of that. To see what was at stake, we want to know what he gained. I agree. Yeah. And what he lost. Yeah. What did I lose? I guess some people I used to call friends because I saw the argument and started taking them through it and they got mad. They don't want to be around me anymore, which, oh well. Uh, are, you, are we asking about, do I slip into it again? What's it like to not be in that state that it's all relative? I have trouble remembering what it was like being in it, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Do I have to go back and think of what I, the way I used to think? I, I no longer think that way. Right, I don't know if I, in, in a way, sure, it comes up, but uh, in a, not, not like I was, I can't really relate to how I once thought. Like, no. I, I know that it, I remember it, but it's quite foreign, no, in a see, way. Different being. Right, right. Uh, like the idea of uh, beauty itself, I would have denied it. There, There is none of that. What are you talking about? But going through, it, is it all relative and seeing it, I'm like, there, that open a possibility. And then uh, yeah. read some text and went, really, this is, uh, this is quite a bit different than everything else everyone around me says. So I, I thought perhaps it's uh, possible. Let's see what happens. And I took some acid and you know that kind of opened the door <laughs> I remember that night <laughs> oh you were there for that one too yeah. <laughs> sure glad we can blame it on someone <laughs> we midwifed him the only thing they did for me is I said hey I'd, I'd put this stuff years ago because I partied as a kid and I'm like I want to take it in a different way but I don't have anywhere to go and they said hang out at our apartment nobody will be here we need Live it up. <laughs> he kept having enlightenment experiences and then forgetting them. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I'd talk I him back through and he'd remember and he'd forget. Oh, my God. And he'd remember and he'd forget. <laughs> and I'd be like, remember, you, remember? He'd be like, oh! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But so, therefore, then we can really I, say, know, Josh, like, you gave beauty. still happens in a way, but not as intense. Like, a, you know, I'm thinking in the last five, six, eight years, there's been a few where I forget it, and it's like an hour or the next day later, I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> I know what just happened. What the hell did I stop for? <laughs> you catch yourself sooner. Why did I get it? You know, I, I probably could have gone without longer. What did, why did I stop? 
or what was the attraction to get out of that when mm. this isn't the first time? <laughs> so you gained beauty itself, a way of being, a memory, and remembering that you forget. Am I? Did I can? Did I gather his idea? And a, yeah, and a whole pile of counterattacks to stay away from that. <laughs> Good. So, Pierre, do you remember <laughs> yesterday morning when we were talking about the one and the first hypothesis and the second hypothesis, and we, you said that your teacher, Ji Ming Shen, thought that, I thought that, I think the point was that he said that the one of the first hypothesis was in Chuang Tzu, in nothingness. Yeah. And you said, I said, and what was your response? And it seemed to me at the moment you had a bit of coyness, and you said... Can't remember. That was clever. It, it was, but now I have a chance to ask you again. Go and ahead. you've had several cups of coffee. Go ahead. So, could could we hear what um, such a position on the part of Ji Ming Xian would look like, and on your position in response? Well, I thought I did re respond to mm. it in one respect. I mm. said he used the image of the voltmeter to explore the notion of emptiness. Right. And that's right. You said that when the voltmeter was, when the car was running perfectly, the voltmeter would be at zero or something, right? Uh, nothingness. Right, nothingness. Equanimity. Equanimity. No, not even there. Right? No. So that in a perfect system, a dynamic system, you don't want too much or too little. It has to be exactly on line. That's your realm, right? What does it mean for a voltmeter to be at zero? It means there is no electricity. There's what? There's nothing's happening. How, you how can touch it. But the whole system is working. No, no. In a car, what is that thing? Is that amps or volts? Or? Well, I wouldn't know about cars. I'm not, I'm not qualified for that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, the one that tells you whether you're charging or not charging. Oh. Um, are, are you in neutral? The, the charging one. Like I said, uh, all my training is not for automotive boats okay. or airplanes. It is well, it would be. It, it would be. See, it's it's the relationship between the battery and the charger. Mm. Right, so yeah, and the battery, saying, you're draining energy away, and if your charger is not functioning properly, that that meter should show a, de a increasing decline. If your battery is weak and then you're charging all the time, then you're getting more energy, but you're not able to store it and keep it in equilibrium. The, okay. So he's okay. saying that equilibrium is zero, nothingness. And your response to that would be what? Because well, now I, we have Chuang Tzu. I, we needed your response. I used that in order to get away. Yeah, I noticed that. But that's why I, well, that is true, you gave Chuang Tzu, or gave Ji Ming on Chuang Tzu. You did not give your own response to whether that was an adequate, whether that justified the claim that they did have the first hypothesis in that Taoist system, Chuang Tzu. That's right. Uh, see, he can infer it. Hmm. He can infer it? But there is more to the first hypothesis than, is it, than there is in that image mm. of nothingness in a voltmeter. Or mm. less. Mm. Right. Essentially, you have a drain and an input, right? Something that's mm. constantly going. It's not a positive and negative except in picturesque terms, mm -hmm. right? Because there's nothing positive and negative about about an electrical system which matches the power of positive and negative in thinking. Hmm. Mm. So even though they use similar terms, positive and negative, in the electrical world, you would be very cautious about using that kind of thinking to explore the meaning of negative thinking that appears in the first hypothesis. Agree. I, I can make it worse in the electrical field Depending on what book you read on for AC and DC theory, they will take mm -hmm. positive, 
it will go from positive to negative or negative to positive depending yeah. on the author because as far as I understand it is still not determined which way the electric which way it actually flows the the train of thought goes back and forth throughout the last hundred years of does the electricity go from the positive terminal to the negative or vice versa so when you read the book they say for the purposes of this book we're going to deal with it in this direction yeah. Because I've read a few where they go this way or that way, and, and it makes a big difference as to. Yep. Why do you need a ground? Oh, you've asked me this one lots of times. <laughs> and the best answer I have gotten for for this is, if there is a surge in electricity in your system, it will not save any human person's life, but it will keep your wires, all your equipment, from burning up. Oh, good. So, even though you may be dead, your the, uh, equipment will be good your, be for your air. <laughs> <your equipment, laughs> that's really good. My antique amplifier. But that is why they came ground, up the okay. ground fault circuit interrupter, like the one on your bathroom. With that, that will save your life, or it should. You know, it's working properly. So the ground, the best answer I can get is it's a, it's a redundant backup. To save your equipment, you have to have a flow. It's not really required for the system to work. No. All you need for the system to work is a, a hot lifter. The ground could be like a lightning rod, I guess. Mm -hmm. Or like a, a Ben Franklin with the thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the same thing. That'll stop your house from burning down when the electricity hits it. Mm. So uh, that's the best understanding I have of this so far, Pierre. And I've, I've not talked to anyone that can go beyond that. Well, kind of Barbara's point. Mm. Uh, uh, <clears throat> there is no. There is no system I have come across in Eastern thought hmm. that has been able to express the first hypothesis. Hmm. Wow. They may touch on it, but that's certainly not the same thing as a thorough understanding using a Dianoia. Uh, and equally, well, uh, they, they don't see any need to explore the idea of the self in relationship to the first hypothesis mm. either. Mm. Though there are obviously Upanishads that deal with the self and, and can deal with... Uh, uh, their distinctions are Nirguna Brahma and... right. And Saguna Brahma, that is a, a with and without distinctions. Mm -hmm. But that's not the same thing as being able to show that there's a set of terms that you must use if you're going to be thinking about anything in relationship to anything. And if you look at those key terms, you'll find that none of them are appropriate for trying to understand the first hypothesis. Mm. Right. So, uh, apart from the fact that beyond that, he works out the total number of possibilities in, given in the world of reality, <laughs> and comes up with <laughs> eight possibilities. I mean, that's uh... well. I'm embarrassed to say that when you said if you contract contrast the image of the voltmeter and its significance as we understand it yeah. and the first the whole you know contrast that with the whole of the what the first hypothesis expresses and i embarrassedly went uh-huh <laughs> <laughs> but the reality is <laughs> and how would we what would we end up with if we did that pierre because you know you know what i mean dave i mean i was unwilling to say in the moment that i had no idea what that meant but now i am willing to say that well there's uh uh, 
And the people I had studied with years ago, uh, there was just uh, uh, I take Hinduism when I was studying with Haridat mm -hmm. Chaudhary, <clears throat> who came out of Sri Aurobindo. Uh, there was just such a loyalty to to the mm. to Hinduism, and to think that there can be any influence from the Greek world upon Hinduism mm. was a violation of a sacred trust that there's something pure in Hinduism. Mm. And uh, you know, you, I remember years ago, which I invite everybody to do if you ever get a chance to see it. Uh, years ago, I went to an art exhibit, India, and it was designed so beautifully. Multiple rooms. Each room had a date from the earliest mm, right nice. times looking at architecture and sculpting within a map of India. <clears throat> mm. So, like, you could look at the map of India and look at uh, ho higher and lower, or the uh, north and south uh, Pradesha, and you could see, as you go in different rooms, you could make relative judgments between the location in India and the kind of art they produced. So what? Mm. Well, I was interested in seeing, okay, around 500 B.C., Right, 400 BC, 300 BC, no images of Buddha. Hmm. The Gandharva period, boom. <laughs> and you see all over the place. Buddha's in Buddha's, the long, beautiful robes with drapes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. the statue of Apollo with the Buddha head. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in, when you deal with Hindus, they don't want to admit, they don't want to admit mm. that that was Greek influence. They really, and really, really don't, don't want to admit it. It's like no possibility, thank you very much. Yep. And so when I, in those days, stamps, said, look, even, you want to compare Nargajuna with P Parmenides, I thought that was... That was you know, you could do a variety of things and get away with it. You couldn't get away with this without being into a clash. Mm. And I say, you know, Narcajuna, where did he get his thought? There's nothing like it that came before it. Oh, oh, he lived just 40 miles from Taxlia. Oh. On the Silk Route. <laughs> On the Silk Route, yeah, like, no, that doesn't count. So, like, Muktananda, right? Kashmir Shivism. There's nothing that came before it anywhere that's like what he did. Well, where did they found all his writings under a rock? <laughs> <laughs> Which is, I, I, I found that out true, you know, always look under rocks. Yes. <laughs> but that's Parmenides, third hypothesis, you know? Mm -hmm. Again, story. where is it? Kashmir Shivism happens to be the same thing as Taxlia. Same area. Along the Silk Route, and the and same the, damn thing. And you pointed out that that, ta that university at Taxila, you, we once got that little book and yeah. it made very clear that that was a Hellenistic, not Hellenistic, it was a Greek colony there at Taxi, yeah. right? In the univer what, yeah. university or whatever they want to call it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I had a book on the archaeology of Taxi. You don't still have it? Little skinny book? Was well, it? Uh, oh, you might have it in your storage unit behind the... Behind the, the, behind the, behind the, behind the, behind the. Behind the, under the, over the... <laughs> I have a copy of it somewhere, a photocopy. If yeah. I can find it, it's yeah. behind the under the over the. Yeah. I'll bring it in. Anyhow, 
I'll show them. Maybe I can find it on the... It showed that the, the spirit of comparative philosophy is a great ideal, but you better be in a place where people can do it. And maybe, you know, it's a different world because uh, when I got into this stuff, like, by the way, do you, are you familiar with San Francisco? <laughs> Little yeah. town north, or no, no, that's a big town. Big town, yep. Yeah. Pretty hip Expensive, town. Expensive, yep. Yeah. I was studying Lama Tata, right? A Japanese Buddhist who journeyed into Tibet became the Dalai Lama's 13th, he was just 13th Dalai Lama, Dharma Lama, uh, pardon me, uh, what do they call him, 13th? 13th Dalai Lama D works. 13th Dalai He was the teacher for that guy? Or? Yeah, and he was given an entire trapedica, the entire Buddhist library as a gift as he left. Which had to be hand copied, right? Yeah. It's like in long sheets yeah. and stacked yeah. together yeah. and wrapped. Yeah. Hey. Guy. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I worked with this guy for several years, and we were cro we were so crowded with people. <laughs> <laughs> what a class! What a class! <laughs> hey, then what happened? Acid. Mm. That changed everything. Wow. I mean, really, it changed our culture. Mm -hmm. Timothy Leary, that whole introduction of acid and and the, and peyote and things of that nature yes. were known before, but very few people played it. Here, Co thank coffee? you. Yeah, that's just something. Yeah. So, like, it's a t t totally different world today. Now we have the internet. Yeah. Yeah, no internet. So you can, it's very likely you can do some good comparative work today, but you couldn't in those days. Even today, you know, with the rise of nationalism in India, I don't know, you know, yeah. whether, it would depend on who you got, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so the, the trape trapedico was enough stuff to like fill the back of a pickup truck up to the brim, right? Yeah. Okay, just because uh, it's a lot of stuff. What in happened other words. to all that material? It's a good story. What happened to all the material? To the trapedico? Yeah. <laughs> like, where is it now? Did he get to take it back home? Yeah. Um, well, uh, the president of the school decided, you know, you have to put up a certain amount of cash to have a graduate school. You have to ensure the fact that the school can continue over a period of time and you have to have support financially. He made a deal. He latched on the trapedica, trapedica see, in lieu of cash and took the cash that belonged as to in reserve for the college's purposes on the stock market and uh, laid hold legally of the trapedica. So Lama Tata came to me and uh, Ken Lin and said, hey, he's, he can't do that. It's, 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 this is theft. So, uh, Princess Poon, because Princess Poon is the Theravada Buddhist, a great exponent of Theravada Buddhism, and she was on the staff. And so one Friday night, <clears throat> 2 a.m., Princess Poon opened up the library door, and Ken King and I and the, and the minister of the Buddhist church in Berkeley went in and stole it. Put it in a truck. <laughs> in an Isn't open that truck. cool? <laughs> in an open truck. That, that's the part you need for this next. <laughs> and I'm saying to Lama Tata, hey man, all of these manuscripts, they're in this, uh, this truck. We're going to go across the Oakland Bridge, San Francisco Oakland <laughs> Bridge. You know, it's going to be breezy. 
He said, nothing will move. I said, yeah? He, he said, yeah, don't turn around and look either. I said, okay. No way. Incredible. Isn't that incredible? We, we got it into Berkeley, and there were a group of Sikh, Sikh scholars at, studying at Berkeley, and we housed the stuff there while they had a big police investigation where it went on for a couple of weeks. It didn't fly out. And, well, okay, Where is it? we got word there was a Buddhist captain on a ship going to Japan who would be quite willing to take the whole thing and put it in his cabin. So we rode out there <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. it. loaded it up, and it went to Japan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So and they where is it? and they built a, a special unit in Japan for the Tripitaka with this nice architecture around it and all that. Did it go to Lama Tata's monastery or? Yeah, yeah. I don't know what that one. That's one of, so cool. One of my one of the exploits. Good exploit. Yay! Good exploit. Because these these but you know I I think I present seen would have probably of them. they're like it. like I'm almost like a scroll but they're flat. Right? Yeah, they're flat. And so, yeah, yeah, and they're like a handmade paper, right? Oh or, yeah, or vellum or something. Yeah, they're, I would think they would be very delicate because you know it's an amazing yeah. story. With all of all the uh, great uh, great artworks, beautiful collection. Congratulations! By the way, the end of the story is worth saying. <clears throat> Once we got the stuff on the boat and was on the high seas, Lama Tata, uh, see he's Japanese, but they didn't make the distinction. They thought of him as a Tibetan Lama, which he was a Tibetan Lama, but he was really Japanese. So he started speaking only in Tibetan. You know how many people in San Francisco in 1953 spoke Zero. Tibetan? He was talking to himself, <laughs> essentially. Zero. <laughs> <laughs> talking a foreign language. So they, 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 all, oh, of the, all of these guys were trying to figure out what to do legally. Oh. But, and he's but once Lama Tata, once Lama Tata, <laughs> once Lama Tata knew that the safe stuff was safe going to Japan, he said, uh, he suddenly discovered his Japanese, and he said, uh, my best friend is the publisher of the Tokyo Times. Do you want me to now announce the theft of the Tibetan Tripitaka, our, our Bible? You have an equivalent of maybe a, a religious war on your hands. They blew it apart. It fell apart. Their case fell apart. We walked away free. <laughs> Were you ever questioned? Were you ever questioned by the police or by any authorities? Yeah, they. Oh, yeah. The whole. The whole gang. Yeah, big, all the big guys, all the big suits, and me in my sloppy uniform. I'm putting the screenplay together right yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that'd be a good movie. Yeah. And then the guy has no money because <clears throat> the president of the college cut off all his funds. <clears throat> so, Lamachata says, eh. We ride, so we got in our car, and we visited all of the Japanese farms, hmm. Buddhist Japanese mm -hmm. farms. And <laughs> <laughs> that ended that. He now had enough money to go to Japan in high style, and all right. That was the happy end of the story. Beautiful, right. beautiful yeah. story. Yeah. The minister, Amar, what was his name? Japanese minister. That would be a great movie. Ah.
Tata, no, something. <coughs> 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 Yeah. Well. Pierre, where where would you uh, rank Lama Tata in regards to scene, like with all these other, you know, masters that you're around, like Cory Roshi, and I'm just curious. Ji Min Shin and. Yeah, Ji Min Shin is a native Taoist family. were were Taoists, and mm -hmm. he lived it. Would you say they were all in the same state, like the same clarity or scene? Uh, well, uh, uh, and then there's Alan Watts, there's Dr. Spiegelberg, who's a major philosopher out of Stanford, uh, a guy who is the uh, Islamic whose name escapes me at the moment. Uh, see, very few people wanted to study with Lama Ta, uh, with uh, Ji Ming Shen, because he had an ex, uh, enlarged palate, and that meant it, his diction was difficult, you know, speaking. And it took about four or five weeks to sit around with him before it finally clicked and you could understand him. So many people didn't want to put in that much time and effort. But I did, so. I mean. So he ended up having uh, three or four at the most <coughs> students during those years, same as Lama Tata. But, uh, Lama Tanda at that time was about 80 or so. <clears throat> and uh, uh, he, he had a great interest in America. So he'd say, Pierre, we go. I said, okay, we go. And we'd go down Mission Street in San Francisco. He wanted to see the used, the used, all of the used antique used stores. Secondhand stores. Secondhand. And <clears throat> antique. He wanted to see what people are throwing away. <laughs> and yet would be reselling them, see? That was his interest. But that's amazing at those days because many, many of the things he took an interest in were like wooden frames for some kind of metallurgical work. So they first have to build them in wood with great skill. And he'd just, you know, oh, he'd say, hey, why did they throw this away? And I go, oh, no, the fuck is going to away. You know? <laughs> he says, we don't like, like this is work of ours, you know. He's right, you know, but, you know, yeah. no one thought of workmanship like on this level as a work of art, he, he, he like appreciated. And then a lot of times during this turmoil, uh, he, he'd do this. <laughs> Never knew whether he was asleep or not, but you know what? <laughs> Nothing got through to him that he didn't want to play. Mm. So they'd say, Pierre, come on, talk to him. I'd say, okay. Mm. <laughs> oh, Pierre. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody worth speaking for. With. So it's difficult. Uh, those two men were, were singularly functioning on a, on a nice mm. common level, but... Uh, uh, Trodo is defensive quite a mm. bit, and uh, he's the Hindu guy, right? Yeah. See, I originally went into Eastern thought through the doorway, as it were, of Indian philosophy. So I had a relationship with Chowdhury and then shifted into Buddhism, which is a betrayal, <laughs> you know? Oh. <laughs> and then, you know, 
went into Tibetan thought, and that was a betrayal to the... <laughs> so, uh, that's a kind of fun thing about it. It, didn't, it lasted enough for me, but then it folded up. And part of the reason was, uh, <clears throat> see, the, the university was really at those days the College of the Pacific, and it was a Methodist school mm. that had a lot of support from the Jewish community. Oh, interesting. Methodist school. And what do you think? happened then when they introduced Islamic studies. <coughs> yep. Mm -hmm. Wasn't happy. A bit of friction, one might say. Not happy campers. Money was taken away. So they lost a lot of support. And, uh, Islamic what, studies must have been interesting back then without all the bias that we have on it yeah. now. It must have been uh, pretty pure. Oh, yeah, it was very pure. He used to have classes at UCLA. Oh. Uh, native teachers, distinguished in their own right. Like Haridas Chaudhry, was chosen by Aurobindo to be the professor to represent there in his philosophy, and that's how he got to the United States. And, uh, and when I got into uh, Sri Aurobindo and saw the relationship between Gandhi and Sri Aurobindo is very similar, that neither of, neither of them were Hindus. Hmm. Sri Aurobindo was raised by his father in England and never brought in Hinduism. He was then sent to the best, so-called best schools as well as in France, as well as in England. He wanted to discover Hinduism and he was doing the same thing I was doing. Studying it. <laughs> Studying it. And Gandhi, what he did, he came from, from Africa. He wasn't a Hindu, except by birth, you know, Hindu family. So he took rides on the train to acquaint himself with what it was like to be a Hindu in, in India. Whoa. And all of, his lang all of his language and skill and language came out of having an English good education, just like Sri Aurobindo. And they were both involved in the, the struggle of India going, getting its independence from England. Anyhow, so uh, I used to say, uh, well, we're all alike. We're all studying in books about Hinduism. <laughs> I bet that made you most beloved. <laughs> and I'm studying with a guy who, who knew American and European philosophy better than anyone I had met anywhere else. Sri Aurobindo, at that time we were into the game of dialectic. I, he was into not only, uh, uh, what the hell is his name? Bradley, but he was in McTaggart, McTaggart. Well, he's a, a major thinker in the neo-Hegelian movement. Hmm. And he was more familiar with Western modern philosophy than he was in Hinduism. Wow. <laughs> Who was that? <laughs> but on paper, he's a Hindu and recommended and by Sri Aurobindo, who, <laughs> who had to discover Hinduism like I did. <laughs> You know, it's a mix. Yeah. So, hmm. so occasionally when I'd bring up these points, I wasn't, you know, on everybody's hit list, except a different kind of hit list. 
did was there any interesting consequences for their pathologos? The fact that they were educated, the the Sri Aurobindo and Gandhi, the fact that they had English educations, did that change any of what you might call the familial context of pathologos or? I wasn't into that, uh, at, that, that, that time, at the time, but but. Uh, 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 well, it was to the fifties too. See, and uh, uh, I, I had a very strange, troubled youth, anyhow, and the World War II didn't help it. So, uh, mm. I, I was kind of ready for fighting all the time. Mm. Now I'm not. I'm very mild. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, never confront. Yeah, that's him. why you wrote jo Socrates and Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> no so those there. are uh, rolling out pretty soon, huh? Sure. Those two, Challenge of Parmenides and uh, Socrates and Jesus, ah, are nearing completion. They were. Oh God. <laughs> so Donna, here I come. Maybe just a uh, second edition, they were. Pierre. Get, I I maybe, have. Maybe print it and then a second edition. Maybe no. Well, I already re I I if if are you interested in an early version that was once thought of as complete? Well, a late early version, the latest early version, right? What happened? We have the did, latest did, did, early did, version. Did you see something? You want to take it in a whole new direction? Yes. He's like, he's like okay, Monet. look here. Monet, here. Monet okay. used to have to sneak look, in the look museum here. and touch here, up. Here I am. I finished. <laughs> See, I finished it. Really? See? I finished it. But I knew there was something I didn't like. Hmm. And that was, some time ago, I got into archaeology and I wanted to study the Holy Land, as they called it in those days, or Palestine. And I was always upset with the fact that most of the work done is in the area of Judea, or Palestine or uh, I guess that's further south, because Jesus comes from Galilee, and Galilee was on the border, the end of, of the so-called holy lands in the old days. And in an area, Galilee, that was like uh, 95, at least 90 to 95 percent pagan. And an area that, in, uh, where he was from, there was no evidence of any temple. That bothered me, see, because I said, someone has to be able to, to have a good archeological exploration and say they cannot find any evidence of a, a synagogue or a temple in the area where Jesus was central, and that's Masada and uh, Magdala and uh, Nazareth, that, that whole area, it's called the, the Triangle. So I, I say, you know, uh, it's been about ten, 10 years, I guess, since my last look at archaeology. I wonder what, I really haven't kept up with, I wonder what's going on. So uh, Nancy says, Pierre, uh, go see Dr. Hatton, he's a folk doctor. And I go see him, we have a nice relationship, I have a lot of fun with him. And uh, he looks at my, my feet and uh, clips my nails and we talk. The only trouble is, this was just a couple of days ago, so I'm in the doctor's office and he's got about 20 modern magazines out there, see? And normally, I don't give a shit about magazines. But for some reason, I started looking at and there's a volume on the Smithsonian. And I look at this thing and it's uh, the, the archaeological study of the very area I'm interested in. <laughs> Providential. Yeah. Hey Doc, can I have your magazine? 
<laughs> you I just clipped it. it. <laughs> Does he have? <laughs> it's kind of on the level of who else would be reading it for the next, before the I've next visit. So look at the heading of this. He's got twenty. <laughs> All right. For Jesus, wow. Interesting. Wow, wow. Yeah. An archaeological study of the area never touched before. The very place I want to hear about. <laughs> Providential. <laughs> right on the head. That's the only place they talk about. Wow. There it is. I am. Hellenistic. Mm -hmm. Wow. Right on time. Huh? Right on. Right on yeah. But in it is a couple of references. That's all I needed, <laughs> which I won't tell you about. <coughs> Good bibliography, you mean? Let me look at it. Just what, and I'll give it back. <laughs> <laughs> you won't find. No it. more coffee. <laughs> so, because of that, I got two or three sentences I want to put in there. So, mm. because it it really helps. Uh, and I followed one, one really insightful German, uh, German Jewish author, Hangel, H-E-N-G-E-L, for many years. And he has a new book on the very issue, what he calls the zealots, while well, Jesus was a zealot. And it's a new book. 163 dollars for a 200 page book ah, criminals so oh, he's only going to sell like 50 of them yeah so uh <laughs> all of it I, I went on the web and i'm looking for what library has it i'm going to drive up and take a look at it because i know what i want to look for mm. uh it's um January, February 2016, oh, Smithsonian.com. The search for Jesus. Yeah, this is Michael Hatton. Oh, the, the doc. <laughs> <laughs> he no longer has one, though. <laughs> so I'm going to so I'm going to slip it back to him maybe Monday sure. or Tuesday, but. Uh. <laughs> A thank you note. Make some photocopies. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's got a couple, it has two lines in there that I really need. They found a synagogue in this area. Mm. See, so what? Yes. It appeared that the evidence is that it could only hold no more than 200 people. But Magdala, the center that I have an interest in, had a population of 4,000. Mm. <laughs> so that's like 5%. Mm. And it's the only, so far, it's the only thing they found that suggests a, a temple or a synagogue. So therefore, it's, it still fits the idea that Jesus was an area that was Hellenistic, a, sm a small division of it, had uh, Judaism with a different spirit. Uh-oh, that's what I want. Mm. What was it about this synagogue that made it significantly different than any other? Mm -hmm. So that's where I'm good, at. Good question. Yeah. So it's worth a couple of lines change. Mm. Sounds like a good thing to put like in the beginning or middle. Or what? The end. Like something, or, else, some reference to that. Like, hey, in case you didn't get the message, here's an archaeological reference to what I think you should be understanding. <laughs> well, like, I've seen it. That's the second well, time we so, and anyway, if you'd like a, a quick, a, an earlier version, yeah, I'll send you it. I think so. What about the Parmenides? Actually, I'm more interested in, is the challenge of the Parmenides uh, finished then? Pardon? How about that one? The, the other one, the, the challenge. Oh, the challenge! Oh, that's opinion. still working. Still going on that? Yeah. No, I, I'm. Uh, I found a need to change it, which I do occasionally. Really pops. Ability remains. What yeah. was uh, in a major way? Well, it's a large change. So far, it's about. Uh, maybe 25 more pages or 30 or. 
it's not going to become another uh, uh, Return of the Gods, is it? I hope not. <laughs> That's Nancy's fault. I talked to oh, her, sure. and she oh, says, no. blah, blah, blah. Going to. That's right, Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> The interview that you had that they did. So in Beacon of Mind. Sublime, the interview in yes. Beacon of Mind. In the book by Spet Param, the interview. He said, no, he's got it. He's read it? You yeah. don't? You d I've we got a download it. of the I've whole book for freebie. <laughs> you sent it to us. And you read it? Oh, yeah. What do you read it for? All you have to do is download it. <laughs> <laughs> I did download it to my soul. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and it's still working? Wow. I hope so, yeah. Yeah, so yeah I have but to get really that good. out. It's but you see, uh, I found a couple of other dialogues that I wrote that I forgot that I wrote. Ah. That I want to include in that volume. All right. So Just even the one? first sentence, right? The first sentence is like, uh, "What's he ask you?" Uh, or your reply is, "I'm not interested in um, knowledge and wisdom." Reason and intuition. What is reason and intuition? Anyway, the first sentence is just. What was it? Reason and intuition. Well, I there thought was, it was there wisdom. Was a question about I'm not interested. He says I'm not interested in uh, definitions. Uh, okay. Definitions, but how things function. Mm -hmm. Oh, right. Is that it? Yeah. Yeah, but that was like this. That was one of the later he, questions. He asked you to define reason and intuition. I think. Oh. And then. I, I don't. I read it. I I wrote it, and. Uh, I'm interested. That here. It's the interview. I have the interview. Oh, the interview. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's in that new book. Yeah. That's a, that's oh. Like, yeah. I was just. I don't even. How much I, was I hate to it. say. I don't even remember wow, the, being I like interviewed. It. I, I, the someone the came up and I started talking and I wrote it down. <laughs> I said, left. I just, and the symmetry, right? And how, what you do with symmetry? I, I have no. I'm, I haven't read it. Well, Penrose and Spencer and that Robbie lady should read it. Yeah, and then I, then I, I found out it's in one. this book with a bunch of other people. I'd be interested in knowing it. <laughs> Chris wasn't bad. It just didn't seem very bold. Yeah. It seemed like she was. Sir Roger Penrose, Jaffe. But I didn't read the other. Whole bunch of people. What are these dialogues you were referring to? Because he was mentioning the interview. You're like, well, he's these two dialogues I didn't even know I wrote. <laughs> Oh, that's another. So that's yeah, what I thought he was talking I, about. That's what I'm asking about. Well, <laughs> what are these that's, little nuggets here. So I have to put that in with the other. So I got about. You got ten of them out there. Well, there's more now. Oh. <laughs> because I found a couple. I forgot I. Put what are those? Oh, that. Well, other we have dialogues. to know because he, because we're notorious for archiving. Yeah, well, I get it out. Okay, Nedge. Let's go. Well, he wants we'll to be talk. swept away before another tide. Before we start hearing about more dreams. I gotta hide. Now that's just perception. I <laughs> <laughs> can't see you. I like can't Thank you, David. Why don't we help you move some chairs? Barbara. Yeah. I'll do that with him. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, I got, I got well, we caught the day's oh, sunlight, didn't we? Fun. Yeah, right. Thank you. Uh, uh, how was the dream? Oh, wow. It was good. I talked to Jeff this morning, and he added a point that I hadn't seen. Or actually, I had a question about, and that was the name of the guy, person was a scout or a point man, actually, it came well, it out. And, and them, he said, those are the people. Right, the, the reason I would, had a question was because I would say, why would I go back into a property that I, I was trespassing? And he said, scouts and point men go behind yeah. Yeah. lines mm -hmm. into places that are not their own. Mm -hmm. In order to find out more about what they are. Yeah. By the way, That's would that be the ideal chicky chappy oh, people? No. No, no, they would. They would be like you. You're no, the, the ideal chicky chappy people. Okay. <laughs>